Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna explain why I hit the pre-order button on the R7 as soon as it was available. I wanna discuss the five key features that are important to me in any wildlife camera. Those features allow you to take amazing shots of wildlife. Before we even talk about this, we need to consider one important thing. The R7 is $1,500 US. It is significantly cheaper than the R6, the R5, and of course the R3. So we can't really compare it to those cameras. And the features we get for $1,500 are just incredible and it blows me away. The first thing that I consider to be almost paramount in any wildlife camera is the autofocus system. The autofocus system allows us to track subjects, get them nice and sharp, and without good autofocus, you're always gonna struggle. What I have with me today is I've got the R5, I've got the 800 F11, which is an affordable prime by Canon, and I've obviously I've just got my monitor on here to record what I see. So the autofocus system, you might not see it, but there's a kangaroo just laying over here chilling out. Seems to be quite tame, so I'm probably gonna be able to get quite close to it. What I wanna do is just show you how the autofocus system works on these Canon mirrorless bodies. Let's look at how well it tracks the eye. Let's go and photograph this kangaroo. a bit of a struggle, there he is. So there's the kangaroo, if I hit auto IAF, bang, straight onto the eye of the kangaroo, which is pretty cool. This here is full frame, and that is 800 millimeters. So let's just whack it into 1.6 crop mode, which is what the R7 would be, and we would almost have a headshot. And I can just obviously take those photos of that kangaroo. All right, so you saw how well the autofocus worked picking up that kangaroo eye. And the R7 is gonna work just like that. It's gonna have eye tracking on animals and the birds, kangaroos, etc. It's just gonna lock on that eye and follow it around. But the advantage of the R7 over the R5 is it actually inherits the R3 autofocus. There's not a huge difference, but on the R3 and the upcoming R7, you can initiate tracking from any autofocus mode. So if you have spot autofocus, you can place that on the subject and then initiate tracking. You can even have zone, so maybe you just want the tracking within a certain zone. You can do that on the R7, whereas we can't do that on the R5. So that's exciting. And the other thing I just noticed is many of you will probably have these uh, F11 lenses or maybe using converters, and you may have noticed that on a full frame, the autofocus box gets quite small. So if we have a look at this kangaroo, you can see in full frame mode how small the autofocus box is. But if we go into crop mode, which is what the R7 will be, our actual autofocus box is much bigger. So that's actually another advantage. <laughs> this one's just chilling out. It's a tough life being a kangaroo, that's for sure. But that's one advantage I didn't even think of, is with the R7, you're probably gonna have a bigger autofocus box when using these F11 lenses. So overall, the autofocus of the R7 is incredible. And I'm not sure of any other camera in that price range that gets animal eye auto tracking as good as that camera. And so for me, the autofocus system is a massive tick. There's just no comparison. The autofocus system is so much better than the old DSLRs that you can't even compare them. The R7 is just gonna blow them out of the water and your keeper rate is gonna be much higher because you're gonna get those birds in focus and they're gonna be sharp. So that's awesome. All right, let's go and see if we can find a different bird to photograph. All right, so the second major feature of the R7 in our wildlife camera is obviously the sensor and how good it is, what type of sensor it is. So the R7 gets the 32.5 megapixel APS-C crop sensor from Canon. Now it's not gonna be exactly the same as the 90D, apparently they've made some improvements to it, I don't know how many, but it is a front side illuminated sensor. So it's not as good as some of those sensors from Sony and Fuji that have faster readout, so it will suffer from rolling shutter. So a lot of people will pick up the R7 for the extra reach it gives us for wildlife. Now when we talk about reach, we're talking about effective focal length. So when we use an APS-C crop sensor, it obviously makes the subject much bigger. So I've got this 800 millimeter lens here on the R5. It's an 800 millimeter focal length. However, if this was the R7, we times the 800 by 1.6, so 8.6 is 48, so it's 1280 millimeters effective focal length when it's on the R7. That's just gonna make the subject much, much bigger. Now I could do a whole video on full frame versus APS-C, and most people will say, well Dwayne, why don't you just crop the R5? And yes, I could just crop the R5 to the same field of view. However, if I do that on the R5, I end up with a 17 megapixel file. The R7, as I mentioned, is 32.5. Now, if I had the R6 and I cropped that, I'd have like a six or seven megapixel image. 
Now the only real advantage to this APS-C is when the subject is far away and you want to make, bring it much closer to you. So you can't see it, but there's a mob of kangaroos out here on the open and I am a long way off. So if I have a look at what this looks like, so we've got this mob of kangaroos here. Now if I initiate crop and what the R7 will look like, it goes from that to that. You can see how much bigger those subjects are. At 1.6 crop, the subjects are just much, much bigger. They're big boys having a good scratch there. And it makes quite a difference. And you have to remember that 32 megapixels is a lot more pixels on the subject than 17 in the crop mode. Now we kind of lose that advantage if we can get close to the subject. So if you can get close to the subject, 45 megapixels full frame is gonna give you a far superior image than a 32 megapixel crop image. But the issue, as we know with wildlife and birding is we often just can't get close. And most people want the bird bigger in the frame and the APS-C is gonna give you that. So the other advantage of APS-C is just purely the cost, $1,500 we can actually get a subject that's bigger in the frame than using a full frame camera. So we don't necessarily need the biggest, fastest lenses from Canon. We can get away with perhaps using this 800 f11, which would give us 1280 millimeters focal length. This is gonna be more than you would ever need. And so, you know, 1500 for the camera, and I forget what this lens is, it might be $1,000. So for two and a half thousand US, you're gonna have a lot of focal length, <laughs> which you know, doesn't work all the time, but if you can't get close to animals, this is gonna be an incredible kit. So why don't we walk down and see if we can't get ourselves a bit closer to these kangaroos. Maybe we'll find a duck or a bird or something just to give that focal length a bit of a whirl and see how we go. All right, so. We've got a uh, little pied cormorant on this log over here. Let's go and see how the 1280 millimeter focal length allows us to get quite a big bird. A very quick tip, <laughs> always remember your background. So this cormorant where it is, we've got grass in the background. It's no good, I don't like that shot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk backwards and try and shoot this way to get the background further away. See if we can't do that. All right, that angle is much better. So we can see the autofocus is working. 1280 millimeters is a lot. I'm quite a way away. Background's quite nice. It'd be great if you put his wings out again. So I think you saw there just by moving how that background changed, but that focal length, man, that was incredible. I didn't even have to get very close to that bird. And the advantage of being able to be further away is you're less likely to spook it. All right, so the third really important feature of any wildlife camera is its FPS and its buffer. So how many shots can we take to freeze the action? So the R7 has class leading FPS. It's got 15 frames per second mechanical and 30 frames per second electronic. To put the 15 frames per second in context, I think only the 1DX Mark III has more at 16. The R5 has 12, I think the R3 has 12. 15 is just incredible for a mechanical shutter. So that's really, really impressive. Now it does list 30 frames per second electronic. And to be honest, it's just a gimmick. There is no way you could ever use 30 frames per second on the R7. And the reason being is the woeful buffer of the R7. So when we talk about the buffer, we're talking about how many images can we take in a row before the camera stops taking images. So it stores images in the memory of the camera as it's writing to the SD card, and it can only store so many photos in that buffer before the camera just shuts up shop. There's nothing worse than taking a burst of shots and then the camera goes eh, and just won't let you take any photos. It's, it's horrible. The buffer of the R7 in full raw is 40 shots. So you do the math, if we're shooting at 30 frames per second electronic, we're gonna be able to shoot for just over a second before the camera fills up the buffer and says no more. And the biggest issue, and I don't know this till I try it, is some rumors are saying that it takes up to eight seconds or longer to clear the buffer of the R7 because it's using dual SD cards. So you're limited by the speed that it can write to that SD card. I suggest if you're shooting for a second, waiting for eight seconds, you're gonna miss a lot of photos and it would just be unusable. Thankfully, 
there is a way to get around this. And what I will be using once I get the R7 is I will shoot in 15 frames per second, either mechanical or an electronic. So you can reduce the electronic shutter down to 15 frames per second. So at 15 frames per second, if we shoot in full raw, we're still gonna have a bit of an issue. So I suggest that you change to compressed raw, which is C raw, and that means the files will be about half the size. Because the files are smaller, we can take more shots into our buffer. So my understanding is that in C raw, at 15 frames per second, the R7 will give us about 100 shots. So 100 shots is pretty good. Divide that by 15, I think it gives you close to seven seconds if you started with a clear buffer of shots. So 100 shots would be quite a lot in a row. And to be honest, with 1,500 bucks, 100 shot buffer, 15 frames per second, I reckon that's usable and I think we'll be fine. So at 15 frames per second, you know, you can hold down the shutter and just get different behavior. And that's the beauty of having such high frames per second. I've got too much focal length, let's be honest. 1280 millimeters is just kind of ridiculous. And for bigger subjects like these kangaroos, you're never gonna be able to frame them all that well. So that is a limitation. You can have too much focal length. 15 frames per second, 100 buffer, which should be fine. Okay, so the fourth thing that's really important to be in a wildlife camera is its high ISO performance. The R5, the R6 have just been incredible. They've kind of been game changing. The ability to shoot at ISO 6400, 12,800 and get usable images means that we can use these slower lenses, we can shoot in low light and we can get a lot more sharp images. So how's the R7 gonna perform? Well, I suspect it's gonna be about a stop worse than these. So I think you're still gonna be able to shoot at ISO 3200 to 6400 using noise reduction software like DxO Pure Raw. I reckon it's gonna be fine. Now I did shoot with the 90D, which has the same megapixel sized APS-C sensor. I took this shot of an Eastern Spine Bill, ISO 3200 cleaned up reasonably well. So there's a lot more to ISO than just the number. A lot of the time it's just how much light reaches your sensor but I'm not that worried to be honest. For $1,500, I reckon it's gonna be more than adequate. So until I get the camera, I'll do some tests in the field and share those with you, but I don't think it's gonna be an issue like it was on the 7D, et cetera. So I'm excited about trying the ISO performance of the R7. Oh, look at this shot. kangaroo in the grass. It's incredible. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> There's a kangaroo here in the grass. It's raised its head, chewing on some grass. So the autofocus, the, <laughs> the frames per second, all these things are working for us. Oh, this is nice. So I guess the fifth thing that's really important to me is just the ergonomics, the build quality, the weight, how it feels in your hand, how easy it is to customize. And the R7 is definitely different from the R5 and the R6 and a lot of people have been complaining about it. But hey, I, I'm gonna give Canon the benefit of the doubt. They seem to know what they're doing. I'm not gonna judge it till I get it. Now the control dial around the joystick is interesting. Hopefully you don't knock the exposure as you're adjusting the joystick. That would be a bit of a bummer. I'm used to the R5 layout. I've always liked the control dial on the back where it is. On the R5, we've also got a shoulder dial and a front dial. So we've got three dials. So if you shoot in manual, it's great because you can do your exposure. You can do your shutter speed aperture or ISO on any dial without leaving your eye from the viewfinder. It would have been nice for them just to give it to us. I think the 90D has the control dial on the D-pad and even the R10, I think, has a shoulder dial. So they could have given it to us. Um, more the better in my regard. But I think you can change the ISO or aperture on the D-pad just by going up and down. I think some of the Sony bodies are the same. So you're gonna be able to get around it. There's lots of customizable buttons on, this, on the R7. I think it's still gonna feel good in the hand. You'll get used to it. Your brain will get used to it. I'm not concerned about it. I look forward to it actually and just trying it out. So we've still got a touch of sunlight and I can see that little kangaroo over here. So let's just see what he looks like in this light. There 
as the little guy. It's amazing what a difference the light makes. Like this little kangaroo just looks amazing with this sunlight coming down. So for 1500, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. If you've got a 90D, 7D2, or you've got a DSLR, an old 5D, and you're wanting to get into the mirrorless realm, I think this, this R7 is the way to do it. It's gonna take awesome photos. At the end of the day, that's what we want. We want a camera that can take great photos, and the R7 will be able to take great photos. At that price point, I think it's an excellent value. Pair it with an 800 F11, a 100 to 400, a 100 to 500. You've got all these options now. I'm just happy Canon have released these cameras and you no longer have to spend a fortune on the R6 or the R5. You've got an affordable option. I'm excited, I can't wait. I get it just like everyone else, I've pre-ordered it. So hopefully the end of June, I'll get it and I'll do some tests in the field. Um, so I can't wait till then. Let me know in the comments below whether you've pre-ordered it. What do you think about its specs? Is anything disappointing you? What are your overall thoughts? I'd love to know and get a conversation going. So until the next video, take care. Happy birding, see you later. So on here or aperture pro, um, compens or aperture compensation aperture. Uh, the fourth thing was what was the fourth thing?